Jump on the stage. Talk about security. Um, good morning. Um, I just want to uh, preface this talk a little bit. So this was actually a talk that was written out of frustration for a smaller conference in Australia earlier this year. And someone came up to me afterwards and said, you know, man, that would make a really good keynote. And then uh, a few months later, Halva put in his slide deck that keynotes uh, golf for retired researchers. So this is not a keynote or anything related to it. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here. About 10 years ago, uh, myself and a couple of friends started a conference here in Wellington. And um, one of the things when you run a conference is you don't really get to attend the conference. So it's actually pretty awesome just to be able to attend and speak at a conference. So a little bit of introduction. My name's Mark. People call me Pipes. Um, my official job title is a network ransacker. Um, and really what I wanted to talk to today is, even though we're in the red team track, this is more of a talk for the blue team. Um, and this is a talk about how to make my job harder, right? And that could be seen as a little bit, why would you want to do that, Pipes? And it's like, because I like a challenge. I like it when my job's harder. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through some strategies today. We're going to go through some strategies related to how the red team and adversaries and attackers sort of play their game and how the blue team can sort of leverage understanding those strategies to get some really quick and simple wins across their systems. We're going to go beyond patching. Um, I recently gave um, some talks for Microsoft. And um, when we were there, we were working out, like, what is the number one mitigation that you should be doing? And unfortunately, patching still came up tops. And I'm like, well, I don't really care about patching. Everyone should be patching anyway. Before I get started, I really wanted to touch on threat modeling. How many people here saw Darren Bilby's talk at KiwiCon? I think it was last year. Yeah. One of the things that Darren had was a really good point, is that's when it comes to looking at adversaries and when it comes to looking at attackers, is we love to threat model and we don't do it very well. And James Mickens from Microsoft Research gave this really awesome white paper sort of into Usenix, which sort of outlined the fact that when it comes to understanding risk and when it comes to threat modeling, we tend to go straight to the Mossads, right? We, like, if Mossad wants to massage you, they're going to massage you with Mossadi things, right? And so... One of the things that I want to keep in mind as we go through this morning is that um, threat modeling is important, and it's important to go beyond what we see in the headlines. It's important to go beyond the APT threat reports. It's important to go beyond nation state, as we like to call it, and really consider ecosystems as a whole. How many people know this guy? Yeah, Willie Apiata, sort of Victoria Cross winner, SAS Special Forces operative leader, stormed Kabul, took out the terrorists. Um, in the red team, a lot of people like to think we're this guy, right? We like to think that we're special forces operations, that we have tactical gear, and that we've got some cool tricks, and we're going to come and show them off on your network or against your organization, and it's going to go through and we're going to win, right? Um, it, it's not true. We're talking about computer security, right? We're talking about, like, literally just laptops and servers, and we're talking about, like, you know, running scripts and, and sort of going through strategy. But... So one of the things I want people to consider and take away from today is that there is no magic when it comes to attacking an organization or a network, right? There's some um, considerations, there's some technical thinking, there's some um, processes we go through, there's um, you know, a little bit of creativity behind it, but there's no magic, right? This isn't wizardry, this isn't hardcore special forces operations, this is just computer security. So one of the things I want to do when we go through this morning is we want to break down sort of common strategies that attackers will use and how we can sort of mitigate against them. And one of the things I was doing when I was working on this talk was thinking about how can we distill it down? Can we distill it down to its absolute essence on what this magic that people seem to perceive is? And the answer is pretty simple. Attackers want to get creds and own stuff, right? And if you look at any sort of modern attacker nowadays, like the way they do it very different sometimes. The approach that we take is very different sometimes. The, um, it may be like, you know, phishing for credentials or it may be phishing with a payload to get execution on a laptop and then getting credentials out of memory, right? The idea is, is that we want to get creds and we want to use them to own stuff. And it's pretty simple. And it's, it's most of the attacks, I mean, even some of the newer ransomware variants, as I understand it, are very much leveraging, like, you know, out of memory credentials to spread laterally across networks to encrypt more files and stuff like that. So my job, my job is a network ransacker. It is to break into organizations. It is to do application security testing. It is to do all the offensive security stuff that we love to do. But when it comes to explaining my job, it's actually pretty difficult, right? My job is effectively playing pinball, right? I am 
on your network. Your network is the table, your application's the table. If you've ever played pinball, it's a really awesome game. There's lots of ramps and traps and bonuses and combos and lots of tricks that you've got to go through with various trick shots. So as an attacker, I'm playing pinball. And in order to play pinball, I have to get a ball on the table, right? So if I have a ball on your table, what can I do with that ball? I have to sort of maneuver it up a ramp, or I have to get it up the same ramp three times in order to get the bonus points, or I want to trigger multi-ball, right? Multi-ball would be awesome, because that means I've got multiple credentials and multiple ways around your network or environment. So when it comes to working through strategies, it's kind of like, okay, can you make your table as hard as possible for me to play on? Can you make it as tricky as possible for me to play on? Can you make it easier for my ball to get sunk into a hole on your table? Can it make it easier for me to trigger tilt mode and shut down the, the flippers so that the ball comes back out of the network, right? And in order to play on your table, I need to spend money. Like, my mum used to get really grumpy whenever we went to Cobb & Co, because I'd demand 50 cent pieces to play the Terminator 2 game. And Money is what we need to sort of get onto your table, right? Now, we're talking about money in the sense of coins in this case, and not Bitcoins or any other sort of Dogecoin or whatever it is nowadays. But really looking at, there's an investment from my point, right? At some point, I've decided to invest time or money or risk um, a strategy or a technique in order to get into your environment, right? And what that price is varies greatly, and how I spend my money can vary greatly depending on who I am, right? So we love to talk about nation state having infinite resources and they've got lots and lots of budget and they've got all the cool techniques and they can come in and put it into the table and drop onto your network with six different balls and they can go, go to town and that may be true but there's also various other levels of attackers and various other levels of motivation. Phil Venables summed this up really nicely after the Snowden leaks where he said attackers have bosses and budgets too. Right? And if you think about it, most attackers in 2017 are motivated by finance, they're motivated by money, right? Some are motivated by more political aspects, but they have effectively, either themselves or someone else, they have to justify their time and money for, right? And if they're not making money or achieving their goal inside an environment, right, then they're going to move on or try a different strategy or go, go target, you know, the HVAC provider for your organization that happens to have a point of sale network, for example. So, excuse me. He had a really good point about that, and I thought it was really interesting. Then it was followed up by this awesome tweet by Dino Dozovi, which effectively Dino was sitting there saying, look, defenders have two approaches to reducing attacks, raising cost, right, and decreasing value, right? So if you consider the most simple strategy is if the attackers have a budget and they have a motivation and a goal and data they're after or a goal that they're after, if you can raise the cost of them to be able to get onto the table to target that goal, while reducing the value of what they can actually get out as they play the table, right, then you're actually gonna be in a better position than most. And it's, it's, it's beyond patching, right? It's like, how can we really drive um, some strategies around it? And, and that, that tweet stuck with me. I can't exactly remember when he dropped it. I think it was probably around 2015, and it's, it's been ringing in my ears ever since, right? So in a nutshell, when it comes to the blue team and you're, you've got the pinball table, your job is to increase the cost and decrease the value of the data that I can get, right? So increase the cost to me, decrease the value, right? Um, what happens is when you do this, when you, when you change the way, if you make us go off playbook, if people are using the same playbook across different environments over and over and over, um, it results in a deviation. I have to start taking risks, right? I have to start trying techniques that I may not have tried before, um, attackers may try um, a different payload that they haven't tried before, and you see this hugely at the moment across like the Microsoft Office payload space, right? But what happens is, is that deviation increases risks, and risks means mistakes. And if we're making mistakes and attackers are making mistakes, then you're more likely to catch them within the environment, right? And so when you're red teaming, this is, this is kind of always in the back of your mind, right? Like we have this tried and proven method and all of a sudden it doesn't work, so what are we gonna try next? What is the risk of trying that next? Are we gonna get caught? Are we actually even gonna achieve our objective? Where's it gonna go for, right? So the goal is to turn us into this guy, right? Which is like it's 10 past 11 and you wanna order a McMuffin or some crap like that and just lose it, right? Like one of the things that red teams don't talk about and one of the things that um, you don't often hear about is the frustration. Right? There's nothing worse, for example, than having credentials to an environment and not being in a position to be able to use them. Right? There's nothing worse than it being 11 o'clock at night and it's week three of a test and you actually haven't been able to get into the organization because of various controls that are in place. Right? It's frustrating and it's aggravating. So 
And with that little sort of super basic introduction to attack economics and, and what our goal is today, let's have a look at what's going on. So, strategy number one. So we mentioned earlier that attackers love to get credentials and they love to use them to own stuff, right? So if you're the blue team, multi-factor auth. And I mean proper multi-factor authentication, right? One of the things that we see continuously is, for example, you'll have on-premise corporate network, there'll be legions of controls that are in place, there's VPNs or SSL VPNs, they're all multi-factor auth, they all go through and then all of a sudden the organization is on Office 365 with ADFS one-factor auth, right? And it's kind of like, well, what's going on here? And they're like, well, you know, it's the cloud and we haven't quite figured out what we're going to do there. And it's like, well, actually, no. Like, you know, there's, you need to consider where the credentials are going to be used from, right? There are vectors from Office 365 back onto on-prem, right? There are vectors that have been, been used quite successfully. So um, when it comes to that, non-fishable is preferred, right? Like, um, we're talking UTF keys, that sort of stuff, right? And if you're wondering about why non-fishable, right? And it's like, uh, you know, phishing proxies are a thing, like being able to on-pass, like the actual TOTP and actually log in to sessions are a thing. Um, a quick note that is a subject to much controversy is I'm actually an advocate for SMS if that's all you've got, right? Like a lot of researchers and a lot of organizations say never SMS, right? There's Signal 7, sort of issues, there's number portability issues, there's so many different ways to jack SMS, and even on Red Teams, we have successfully um, gotten SMS tokens to be able to log into to other systems that are sensitive. Um, look, if you have 3,000 users, and you're choosing between one factor auth and one or an SMS, go SMS, right? Like, it's, it's a no-brainer. Like, it's gonna add complexity, it's gonna add risk. Like, if I have to number portability attack a phone, for example, and swap out the SIM through social engineering, there's an increased chance that the target that I just did it to goes, my phone no longer works, right? And that happens, right? If you look at the Coinbase attack that went on where they actually did that against at and um, they noticed pretty much immediately that their phone wasn't working, presumably because they couldn't get to Twitter, right? Like, it's, it's, it's the way it goes. So, anything's better than nothing. And one of the other things about multi-factor auth that we, we tend to forget is that it acts as a very good sort of distributed alerting system. Right? There's nothing worse than if you're on a red team, you see an RDS service, you log in, there's remote desktop services, there's applications published, you click on it, and nothing happens. Right? And the reason why nothing happens is because somewhere a user just got a notification saying, hey, we're trying to log into blah, 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 blah. Right? And it's a sinking feeling for the attacker because it means they've definitely been caught on that vector and those, those things have been um, burnt, right? So creds often become useless, right? If you manage to fish credentials or you grab credentials and you identify credential reuse out of, say, like, you know, other site compromises, leaked databases, stuff like that, or even just being able to guess credentials, right? Like, you know, winter 2017, still good most of the time. Um, you know, they become useless. They, 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 they're not a useful vector. We've got the creds, but owning stuff becomes a lot harder, right? Now, sure, like, maybe we can re-strategize on how we're gonna send a payload, maybe we can go on site and try to plug into a network port and we've got domain credentials at that point. Um, but really, it becomes layers of frustration, right? And that's what we're after here, because anytime we're frustrated, you've increased the cost, right? Strategy number two, restricting operating environments. So one of the things that um, <coughs> once you've got credentials or even if you manage to sort of successfully fish with a, a DocX or an XLSX or whatever, for example, and you're on a laptop, or inside the target environment, right? Quite often there's absolutely no controls that are actually affected, right? Like, you know, like one of the, and when we say operating environment, we don't just mean the laptop. I mean, it may be the VDI. If you're talking about applications, it may be the way that the web application sort of structured to present the data back to the user and stuff like that. But really what you wanna do is you wanna res restrict execution, right? Like any and all. And we talk about AV and we talk about whitelisting and like, you know, I guess having AV is good if, like, you know, I'm sure Tavisoe disagrees with us on that, but the, the idea that um, you can restrict the operating environment, right? You want to lock me down, right? Make lateral movement more difficult. Um, it's a great way to bottleneck the attacker, right? So, for example, if it is a VDI environment, for example, you can put the controls in behind the background, right? So you may be on a desktop, but what's actually happening in the background, what monitoring's happening in the background? Is there anomaly monitoring happening in the background? Is there traffic monitoring happening in the background? Is there 
you know, memory scanning, file rights, um, going to the SAN, that sort of stuff, right? So anytime you can restrict the operating environment, and Cubes, which is in the picture, is a great example of this, means that you're going to win. And I mean, if you're looking at something like Windows, like, if you're looking at, like, you know, device guard and, and sort of various other technologies that are coming in at a Windows level, it's, it's getting pretty good. But the idea is, is that um, you want to restrict it. The other thing that we sort of see a couple of times is we've seen a policy where the concept of privileged access workstations, right, pause, right? So that's where your domain admins have a separate workstation build in a separate environment for doing sensitive tasks. That can be really frustrating because they may usually have a policy of we can't be bothered logging into that other sort of VDI of the user and, and checking it out, so we're just going to rebuild that VDI, right? So you can end up in positions, for example, where you've managed to compromise an endpoint and you may be rummaging in memory for those credentials that we love and we want to be able to use, and you find that actually no administrator has logged into this VDI, no one other than this user has logged into this VDI, and there's no credentials cached in memory to sort of go onwards from there. So you can um, do a lot of work when you lock down the operating environment, for, especially for your admins, where um, you know, either getting credentials or then figuring out how to move on next. And sure, if we look at application whitelisting, for example, if you look at something like AppLocker, for example, like there are bypasses, right? There's magnitudes of bypasses. But here's the thing. Quite often when you're dropping a payload and you're ending up on an environment, you're doing it blind, right? Not all bypasses are generic. Right? Not all bypasses apply to the same environments across different customers. So working out stuff blind can be frustrating and increases cost, right? Also increases the cost of, um, the likelihood of mistakes and therefore increases the, the likelihood of detection. So when you restrict operating environments, you turn us into um, Ari here. Um, sort of, it, it's just frustrating, right? If you can't actually execute the tasks that you want to do to move laterally on target, um, it just really destroys it. Um, strategy number three. Who can name the guy on this slide? Rob Joyce. Good call. Who's seen this talk? Half a dozen hands, maybe? If you haven't seen Rob Joyce's talk from Enigma last year, go watch it. Um, Rob was the head of tailored access operations for uh, the NSA, and he showed up in Enigma, which was kind of strange, and he gave a talk about how nation states are going to target you. Right? And what was really pleasing about this talk is it aligned greatly with our, the way that we operated in Somnia, right? So I was like, felt justified. I was like, yeah, vindicated. Um, but it was, a, it was a, a talk that was kind of seen as flaky. It was a talk that was kind of seen as like, well, you know, he advocated using AV, and we all know that they have AV exploits and blah, 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 blah. But he had a really interesting point, right? And his point was, attackers are going to know your environment as good as, if not better than you. Right? They're going to take the time to know the environment as good as, if not better than you. They know how you manage your environment. Right? And this doesn't just apply to nation states. Right? If you look at the Swift banking hacks that occurred recently, there was a reconnaissance phase where they sat in there and they monitored how do you do your job? Which systems do you do your job on? How do you go about it? Where is it locked? Right? And it's the same for a lot of the more... Um, I guess financial, like CFO, if you've seen the CFO fraud where email accounts have been compromised and you go away and you send off an invoice man in the middle of the supplier, they're taking the time to understand what is the process? How does the business work? Where are the systems? Who manages those systems? Who's responsible for them? What are the users? What are the users' groups? Where do those users work? And they go through that process, right? And so shadow IT is the buzzword, right? But the reality is, is that it's getting people owned and it's getting people owned hard. Right? And the reason is it's quite often easy to spot anomaly systems, right? Like if you look at an environment and it's all standard build, standard configured, standard security controls, there's like everything's in place. And then all of a sudden there's this one system, right? And it's out there and you look at it and it hasn't been patched or it's kind of like got no, no sort of restrictions on it. It's on the domain. Um, if you're looking at cloud, right, for example, the amount of times you can look at organization and they've got everything locked down, they've got Office 365, it's just sweet for their users and MX is going through there, they've got their on-prem VPN and then all of a sudden you find like, you know, an Altassian Jira instance or something that's just randomly out there that's got no 2FA on it, that's got like credentials that can be reused into it and quite often when we go back to the organization and talk to them, they're like, Ah, uh, yeah, we kind of knew about that box. It was just like a vendor environment. It's not really our problem. And it's like, well, it is, because it's on your domain, right? And we just owned it. Or they go, ah, oh, yeah, we didn't actually know that Jira instance was in use, right, up in the cloud. And it's like, because someone just went and got a manager's credit card after being told no, 
right? And they've got managers, credit cards, logged in, signed up a new Jira instance, right? So one of the biggest capability gaps we see is that people don't know their environment or they don't want to know their environment, right? And the thing is attackers will know your environment and they will find the weaknesses and exploit it. And they really understand trust relationships, right? The amount of times that we move from cloud into on-prem, right, is, is pretty decent. And customers are always surprised, right? Because it's up in the cloud, it's not, it's not on our prem, it's up there, but there's a trust relationship, right? In the case of Active Directory, it may be a forest relationship back up to Azure. Um, in the case of something like you know, Google services, it may be that drive is in use and they're syncing files down onto the file system, right? And they're opening Word documents and MS Word on the file system from a trusted source, as far as they're concerned, right? So there is avenues to come back in. So one of the things about saying yes is that you get to enforce your controls, right? So um, a great example of this was a little while ago I was doing a red team and during the red team we noticed that they had adopted a cloud storage service and we were like rubbing our hands because we're like, yeah, we're gonna get creds, we're gonna pop into there, we're gonna own everything. And we got creds and we popped into it and we could see all the files, right? And we started downloading them all and going through. And during the debrief afterwards, we were talking to them and they kind of had seen it, right? Because one of the things they had gone through is they had leveraged the backend APIs of the service to monitor where file downloads were occurring from, where geographic logins were occurring from, where um, anomalous amounts of volume of downloads were going to. Um, and when we, we were on the internal network and we were stealing files left, right and center off SMB shares, they had no visibility of that, right? So they were actually in a better position because they decided to say yes, because the business was asking for it, customers were asking for it, um, to be able to share data. And so what they did was when they said yes, they actually went, right, what are the controls we can put in here? And it's a classic example of where in modern technology, um, controls can actually mean um, better visibility and better, better restrictions on your data and your users than your traditional sort of enterprise network, right? Um, and you also get to gain insight into what's happening in your environment, right? Like, especially with account life cycles, like the amount of times that you look at an organization and they've got like, you know, Active Directory, they've got like X thousand users or whatever, and they have this stringent audit policy. Once a month, someone's going through matching Excel spreadsheets to what's actually in AD, right? And they're going through it hardcore. And then you find like, you know, the admin for that random box, like password is password, right? And it's like, you know, it, and that happens, right? It's because they're not understanding like what is the trust relationships, where do they sit and, and keeping control on it. And everyone always comes back to me and says, yes, but pipes, the vendor said in the SLA that they have to put the box there and we're not allowed to touch it, right? It's like, fine, figure out a way to get more visibility on that box. Figure out a way to get more visibility on the network that's going to that box, right? Figure out a way that you can actually, if you can't control it, you can actually see what's going on as much as possible there, right? Uh, moving on quickly, strategy number four, distributed alerting. This is a newer one and one of my favorite ones. So um, the idea that, you know, one of the things that when it comes across incidents, especially from modern incidents, is like, it's very rarely the security operations center rings up and says, hey, we saw this, right? It's a user saying, my box just blue screened, right? And it's me sitting there going, where did my shell go, right? Or it's like, you know, it's anomalous stuff. Like users know how they use their systems. They know what their day job looks like. They know what's normal. They know when it's not, right? Um, you can monitor um, sort of help desk tickets and really understand people that have, have like lots and lots of problems and then like you can look at it and say, well actually, what, what's the root cause here? And this, a great example of this was the uh, White House Chief of Staff recently, right? Took his Android into the White House support desk and said, I can't update to the latest version. And they're like, that's because Russia's been on this phone for the last three years, right? Like, and it's like, that sort of, you know, people understanding how they do their job and the tools they use is actually a really useful alerting mechanism, right? A really great example of this, and there's a really good blog post to it, was uh, this Ryan Huber and the team at Slack um, basically have implemented it for, say, SSH logins, right? And the idea is, is that if a user logs into a, a privileged system over SSH or whatever, they get a Slack notification saying, hey, you just logged into the server, was it you, yes or no? And if you had no, incidents raised, right? Because it means that someone somehow has managed to authenticate as you onto a sensitive server, right? And um, 
I actually emailed Ryan because like, they dropped this blog post. They said, we've implemented this amazing distributed system. We've got crowd alerting going on, yada, yada, yada. And I said to him, like, how's it working for you, right, as I was implementing my own version of it? And he said, like, we can't give you specific numbers, but at the moment, we're probably responding to less than 10% of requests, right? So they were, the, the, the signal to noise had gone down for them. They were getting, when they got notified saying, no, actually, I did not log into that server, right, they can take it seriously because the user knows what they're doing, right? Uh, go back to multi-factor authentication. There's nothing worse than, as I said, as, as an attacker of you click something or you've done something and nothing's happening because you know there's a prompt on someone's phone at 11 o'clock at night. And then about 10 minutes later, the security manager's ringing you laughing, right? And they say, <laughs> caught you. And it's like, yeah, you did. <laughs> right. <coughs> so best case, you're going to catch us and you're going to catch us pretty quickly, right? Like it's, it's, it's a really effective mechanism. Worst case, we're going to have to move slower, right? Because let's say we've been caught once. All of a sudden, we know, well, any action I take as an assumed role of this user, because that's what we do, we get creds and own stuff as those users, is going to be noticed, right? And we're going to have to tread lightly. How are we going to go about this? We have to now go through and say, well, rather than just SSHing or RDPing to the server, I'm going to have to session ride on an existing session that the user's authenticated through, and I have to go through that process, right? And that is achievable, and we can do it, but it increases cost, right? Restricting privilege. So this is different than restricting operating environments. So how many people here have uh, domain admins that have low privilege and high privilege accounts? Yeah. How many of your admins reuse passwords across those accounts? <laughs> it's about 30% in our experience, right? And again, like we love to talk about how much we audit stuff, but are we auditing the right things? Right? Like attackers have tools now like Bloodhound. If you haven't seen Bloodhound, it means that I can figure out where I landed on your network, what credentials I have, like I have, where the users I'm interested are, where the groups that I'm interested are, and where the systems they are logged into and various other paths that I can take visualized in front of me. Right? And so it means that you know, we can understand, it comes back to what Rob was saying, we will take the time to understand your environment as good as if not better than you, right? The first thing an attacker will do when they get onto a box is desync down your ID and then go through and, and look at it, right? Who is important? Who is the domain admin? Who manages finance, right? What groups are they? Are there vendor contracts? Who are the vendors? What do their vendor accounts look like? Are there service accounts? What do the service accounts look like? What groups have privilege? Like, where are they, right? Because we're acting on a goal. We have a target in mind that we want to get to. So... <coughs> Being able to go through that is kind of important. So one of the things we know about credentials is that they will always get stolen, right? And one of the things that we know about um, password management is that we're terrible at it. Even the best are terrible at it, right? Like we're just not good at it, right? Which is why we've seen this increase in strategies for the, the defense side where we can do stuff like ephemeral access controls, right? Like just-in-time access, right? Like I need privileged access to conduct this task inside this environment and maybe a secondary approval occurs, or maybe that approval occurs for just a particular time window. Um, Bless is a great example of this from Netflix. They open sourced it where, like, you know, effectively every SSH session is a custom SSH key that's been assigned to the user. Key's revoked afterwards. So even if I manage to steal the key from the, the user's workstation, it's not reusable back into that system without some other sort of authorization process occurring in the background, right? Um, <coughs> and identity aware access controls, they, the thing about identity aware access controls is you go, okay, well, this is where if I'm logged into a particular workstation, the network access controls presented to me are for that AD user's group, right? And they can be really frustrating, right? Because all of a sudden, if I'm inside an environment, I can no longer RDP straight from the VDI to the domain controller, for example, or the laptop to the domain controller. So I have to go, where's the domain admin? And I have to fire up Bloodhound and go hunting for the domain admin and then find out they're on a privileged access workstation and they're not on Windows 7 with no controls. They're actually on the latest Windows 10 build with lots of controls and they've got multi-factor authentication and uh, and then you find out they reuse the password anyway. But um, <laughs> uh, the point is it increases the frustration, it increases the cost, right? And it, it's it's some of them can be easy wins, right? Um, one of the things about all of these strategies is that a lot of people go, well, pipes, like, you know, we're, we're a small organization, we have 30,000 users and four admins. And it's like, well, <laughs> like, you can get these wins, right? You can put them in. I mean, Darren's sitting here going, Beyond Corp! And it's like, yes, that's nice if you're at Google scale, like, and you have resources, I mean, but, like, you know, the strategies will increase, increase the cost. 
So again, figuring out where to go gets complicated. Impersonation becomes harder, right? Because that's effectively what we like to do as attackers is impersonate people and assume roles and become those roles, right? Window of opportunity gets re reduced as well. Hard, short recommendation, limit macros, right? Um, even with, like, and I'm going on about like, including DDE and everything else, anything that's dynamic as far as your office documents are concerned, just get rid of them, right? Like, why, why is it in 2017 that we just have time and time again about such and such was popped through a macro, such and such was popped through a DDE exploit? It doesn't matter, right? There are very few times when we go into organizations and we talk to them and they're like, oh yeah, actually there's a hard business requirement to accept unsolicited Word documents to our help desk um, with macros enabled. It's like, okay. Um, like if you need to have them, sign them, right? Deny anything that isn't signed. It, it's doable, it's achievable, it's not that difficult. There's a reason why it's like in the top whatever on ASDs, I think it's top four, like it's number four on ASDs, essential mitigations. Um, there's just no reason for it to actually be a risk. And if you, if you do have a requirement to accept macro enabled documents from other organizations, like move it out of email, right? Move it to an authenticated secure file transfer server or something like that. Move it to a, a service that's sort of out of band away from email, right? And two-factor that file transfer service. <laughs> the last strategy that I really want to touch on is, again, another soft one, right? But it's situational awareness. Now, the amount of times that we go into places, we storm through the network, the, the team sort of has stolen everything, got DA five different ways, owned the active network that they were targeting, and the customer's sitting there going, well, we have a security operations center, we've got AV, we've got like a $3 million Splunk deployment, and we didn't see shit, right? And it's like, well, okay, what were you looking for? It's like, well, no one's reading the logs, right? We pay someone else to do that. Well, what are they looking for, right? Anything that can actually flag and filter generically across all the customers that they're looking for, right? So there are some wins you can have in situational awareness, right? Like um, Zane from, I think it was at Etsy at the time, gave the, this perfectly, right? Know when your house is burning down. You don't need to read every log, but if you get a spike that says all of a sudden I have a ton of failed domain admin authentications going on, right? Maybe that's a warning sign. Right, because you can turn to Steve and say, Steve, did you just log into 30 boxes? No, okay, well, what's going on here, right? So it's not about reading all the logs, right? It's about visualizing the logs. Can you figure out baselines within your environment and do some really basic visualization? Can you pull in Microsoft BI tools? Can you just pull out an um, uh, Elastic instance and just actually start having a look at what visualization we can do with this data, right? And it means that you don't get lost in the details. like. How many people here have seen a suspicious event in their environment and started looking at logs and all of a sudden thought that there was six different nation state attackers in their environment stealing all their data? <laughs> right? Like, it, it's really hard to filter down into what you're actually concerned about and what is normal, right? If you've seen an anomaly where you've seen a spike of failed logins, quite often you'll be like, I actually have no idea where to begin on this, right? But it gives you an indicator. It gives you something that you can monitor, just have on the side, and it means that you don't have to have 37,000 emails a week out of your seam going, I've seen this, for you to ignore, because you know that it's like, you know, Joe in accounting doing something, right? Um, canary tokens are another one that I really wanted to touch on. Canary tokens keep me awake at night, right? For those of you who aren't familiar with canary tokens, the idea is, is that you can um, place a document, a service, um, AWS API keys, um, you can put them it's kind of like a classic honey net example, honey pot example, but you put them in your environment and when someone has read a document that should never be read, you get a notification, right? When someone has tried to use an API key that should never be used, you get a notification. When someone has tried to uh, RDP to a server that should never be able to be RDP to, you get a notification, right? And so the idea is, is that, again, it's almost like visualizing, right? Like rather than worrying about what's going on within your logs, you can actually be like, I only care if someone tries to RDP to this box called DC01 super important dot internal dot organization, right? And so, or someone's just clicked on payroll dot XLSX and the G drive admin temp do not open restricted access, right? Because that's what we do, right? We go to G drive and we go, hey, it says do not open. We're gonna open it and have a look, right? <laughs> um, so it's really important like, to, to, to consider that as well. So to summarize, right, 
attackers have budgets. They have bosses, they have goals, they have things they want to go for, right? And if you can look at their strategies and you can put in some basic mitigations, like if you adopt one of the strategies that we looked at today, you're already doing about better than 50% at least of the organizations that we see. If you adopt two, you're all of a sudden in the top 20%, easy, right? And if you work through it, like, all of the strategies that I've discussed, like, you know, I've, I, I have talked to customers about, we've gone through, it doesn't matter if they're ghetto, like, if your visualization of your failed logins is ghetto and, and, and it's horrible and it breaks every now and then, it doesn't matter because it's still better than nothing, right? If your MFA is SMS, it's still better than nothing, right? If you all of a sudden decide, okay, well, we can't really change the way that passwords and credentials manage, we're just going to do privileged access workstations just for our domain admins, it's still better than nothing. Right? And all of them will increase the cost to attackers when they're executing inside your environment. So um, the last one is obviously, uh, other than destroying macros, is saying yes. Right? Like shadow IT is a big problem. Right? Attackers will know the environment as good as it's not better than you. They'll do it in record time, which is always surprising. And they will take advantage of it. Right? Those trust boundaries, those trust relationships matter. Right? And even though they don't fit in your architectural diagram when you built your network 20, 23 years ago, they matter today, right? And if you really want to understand more about that, go see Middle School's talk tomorrow afternoon because, um, well, I enjoyed it anyway. <laughs> um, and you utilize the user's knowledge, right? Users are the best protection mechanism, in my opinion, um, as far as the anomalies, right? Like, that all of a sudden, like, I got this two factor prompt, like, tell me about it. Or all of a sudden, I noticed that um, I had a new login to my cloud like, you know, file service in my inbox, and it wasn't me, right? That sort of stuff matters. So I think I'm a couple of minutes over, but um, I can't really take questions here now, but I will uh, be around for the conference, and um, yeah, enjoy it.